we actually look at the Canadian statistics, we actually will find that pediatric dental surgery is probably one of the most common outpatient surgical procedures performed at most pediatric surgical facilities in Canada. And when we look at Manitoba in specific, uh, we're finding that over 2,300 kids each year undergo dental surgery in hospital under GA, or general anesthetic. And there are far more who actually have dental surgery being done in private surgical centers that we don't actually know the number. So these children, their teeth are bad, um, they have to have surgery, but what, what we often don't realize is what's really causing or contributing to the risk. And so part of the work that we're doing um, is looking at risk factors for at-risk groups. So some of the groups that tend to have uh, higher rates of tooth decay and have to undergo the surgery more frequently tend to be children from disadvantaged communities. So often this might be First Nations or Aboriginal children in Canada. Uh, increasingly though we're starting to find newcomer populations to Canada as well so immigrants and refugees where there might be changes in diet and access to care issues and then of course those who are just economically disadvantaged maybe living in communities where there aren't dental providers available and so they're not getting early dental visits and that early prevention that's really needed To treat early childhood caries can be actually quite staggering. So for many, especially kids coming from northern communities, um, there's transportation costs. Um, the hospital costs, though, themselves are quite uh, uh, astonishing as well. So it's nursing fees, it's operating room time, it's the anesthetist time, it's the dental surgeon's time. So you factor all of this together, and there have been some estimates that have said sort of each case is uh, approximately $3,500, but when we look at through different agencies that are all paying part of these fees, each year it's millions of dollars that are actually spent on treating kids with severe tooth decay. And you would sort of think that, just imagine if prevention were uh, delivered earlier to these at-risk kids, if you could get them access to dental care and access to brushing um, with fluoride toothpaste and toothbrushes, would you potentially maybe avoid costs down the road? You know, it's still quite shocking that uh, all these resources in the healthcare system are, are going to fixing bad teeth in, in um, otherwise healthy children. Uh, children who do suffer from severe forms of tooth decay uh, experience pain and this can affect their sleeping patterns, their behaviors, so they might be cranky and agitated. Others might become more withdrawn and not want to sort of socialize with their peers. Um, and then some of the other interesting work that we've recently published is starting to look at what's the nutritional link um, is there a link between severe tooth decay and nutritional outcomes in kids? So we're starting to identify that uh, children with severe tooth decay might actually uh, be at risk for malnutrition, specifically uh, they might be iron deficient and have iron deficiency anemia. So one perhaps wonders whether or not the condition of the teeth being so bad and the children experiencing so much pain if it's altering their eating practices and they're avoiding maybe nutritious foods. It's not that, it's they're just baby teeth and they'll eventually fall out, but we need to start making oral health for young kids a priority and making sure that we ensure that most kids uh, go through early life with optimal dental health because that really sets the foundation for sort of longer um, dental health uh, across the life course. Um, the kids who experience cavities at early ages are those who continue to experience dental disease throughout life. So if we can keep them healthy at early ages and prevent them from getting cavities, sort of the impact on their health and well-being is minimized, but also later on on the healthcare sector. A cookie cutter approach doesn't always work well. Um, we know that water fluoridation, access to dental care, fluoride toothpaste has really led to a decrease in cavities in the general population. But among the high-risk groups, these basic strategies still have not necessarily produced those same sort of returns as we've seen um, in other communities. So um, working with the communities, providing them with information and engaging them in the decision-making process I think is really key.